Due to Windows Update changing the sound options on my PC, the footage you're about to see was captured along with irremovable, loud, distorted commentary recorded by my webcam's microphone. This rendered the in-game audio inaudible. As a result, this video will not feature game audio. I've included the few tracks from the soundtrack which are publicly available in the first 10 minutes or so of the video. Otherwise, background music's going to be our standard loop that you hear in our video essays and content patches and such. Please accept my sincere apologies for this. In this situation, I would usually redo the video. Unfortunately, due to my ongoing chemotherapy, one of the side effects is a weakening of the vocal cords, meaning that I go hoarse and I lose my voice a lot easier. After 50 minutes of what I consider to be pretty good commentary on this game, I'm already getting pretty croaky, so replicating that would be very difficult. I understand if you don't want to watch the video as a result of that, there are plenty of other great videos to check out regarding this game. If you want to hear the game audio, I would specifically recommend Giant Bomb's Quick Look and Jim Sterling's look at this game as well. Thank you for your consideration, and here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. This is a video about the game The Surge. And I don't intend to do any sort of formal or full critique on it because it happens to be part of what some would argue is an emerging genre that I'm really bad at and honestly don't have the time or patience to really commit to. I feel like getting the kind of information out of a title like this that a lot of the more hardcore fans of that genre would want is a job for somebody else. But I still want to talk about the game because there's quite a lot to say and some interesting things to point out. And a general discussion, I suppose, about this idea of an emerging genre and that genre being Souls-like or in the minds of some Soulsborn, although some have classified the Soulsborn moniker to only apply to games made by From Software, which you know, is probably applicable, they're probably right on that one. So we can stick with Souls-like for the moment and talk about the notion of it even being a genre at all, and where exactly it's going to go, if anywhere. Now, the reason I bring this up, of course, is because The Surge is unabashedly inspired by Dark Souls, no doubt about it. And it's made by Deck 13, one of the few developers that's actually had a crack at this before. They've tried making a Souls-like game. In fact, they were one of the first studios to do it. And that game was called Lords of the Fallen. And it wasn't that great, unfortunately. Looked all right. But the game itself didn't play very well. And one of the main issues that I had with it beyond its myriad of technical issues on launch was that they seem to have misunderstood what makes combat in a Dark Souls game good. They took all of the elements of Dark Souls combat that could very easily not work if not properly implemented, and then didn't properly implement them. They seem to have misunderstood the whole idea. and It was sluggish. The weapons had unnecessary weight to them that was unnatural, which meant that the combat felt... Again, sluggish, but also not responsive and not authentic or realistic in any way. Their attempt to add weight artificially to every weapon, to the point where it seemed like every weapon weighed 50 kilograms and could only be lifted by a titan, did not work out. And the combat in general felt simplistic, the AI was simplistic, the whole thing just wasn't really a candle on it. And it's a pretty high bar to set when trying to clone a Dark Souls game. Obviously trying to ride the coattails of Dark Souls' success. And I personally have no problem with that at all. In fact, I think it's essential for the development of new genres. It's also a very useful tool for the consumer to know what a game is similar to. But we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we get into the game itself, because this is the second crack at it, and it's a hell of a lot better from what I've seen. I've played about five hours of this, three hours of which was on stream. There's a VOD available if you want to go and check out that raw gameplay involving many deaths to the first boss. But the first thing I want to point out about this is just how impressive the options menu is. And you're probably rolling your eyes over there saying, oh, here it goes again. You want to know why I find options menu so important? It's not just about the notion that we're on PC and as such, we should be able to control our experience. And it's quite important to do so. 
it's not even just about the idea of accessibility for a wider range of people, especially those with, say, disabilities. No, a good options menu represents something a lot greater than that. A good options menu represents contrition from a developer. It represents the self-awareness from a developer to realize that their vision is not necessarily perfect or the right one. Every option you give to a player is the developer giving up control of their baby. It's giving up control of something that they've spent years developing in a bubble inside that development house. And it's very easy, as we've seen in the past, to be misled by that development bubble, to believe that something is right, to believe that something is the way to go or not even consider that something might be a problem when the game comes out. A recent example of this is the development bubble that Domina found itself in, which is an interesting little indie gladiatorial game. The game released without a save game feature, and the developer was confused when people asked for it. I said, well, why would you need that? Runs are pretty quick. I was like, yeah, for you. In fact, the runs in the game could take anywhere up to four hours, and the dev originally just didn't understand why people wanted a save game feature. Eventually it was implemented, but that's just an example of getting caught up in your own development bubble and not understanding the perspective of people outside it. When you have a menu like this, particularly when you give the option to do things like turn off the finisher animations and special camera effects, that to me is an excellent move from the developer. It's a consumer-friendly move from the developer. It clearly shows that the developer is concerned most importantly with your personal experience first over what they think is the right way to experience the game. Hugely important and should be lauded and praised. In general, this options menu is just very, very good. Not only do they give a lot of UI customization, they give you the ability to customize that camera, do things like turn auto lock on, on and off, and all that sort of thing. But they also give detailed descriptions of what every option actually does, and this also applies to the graphics options. And far too few games do this, honestly. I would love to see more games do this in greater detail. Even if you go to the controls, it gives description of exactly what each control actually does, and even additional information if the control happens to be unbound or if you're using a controller instead of a keyboard and all that sort of thing. This is impressive. This is a developer that has very clearly gone out of its way to understand the potential needs of its PC using consumer base. And they should be lauded for this. This is a very, very good thing indeed. This should be an example set to other developers. That is why options menus are important. It is not simply a gimmick. I believe fundamentally that a good options menu demonstrates goodwill and contrition and understanding from a developer. And that's always a good thing. That means you're buying into a product that the developer genuinely believes is good but is also willing to allow you to alter the experience of outside of their preferred parameters. Supreme developer confidence. Very good thing indeed. All right. I've stopped lording over that. Let's jump into the game and show you what's going on with it. We're going to talk about what this game does. There's going to be a lot of comparisons to Dark Souls for obvious reasons. When ow, why, why on earth would it... Okay, so it spawned me in the middle of combat, which is extremely unusual, and I'm not really sure why it would have done that, but okay. I would have thought it would have spawned me back at the op center, which is the game's equivalent of a bonfire, but they decided not to do that. Okay. Well, surprise! Oh, Lord. All right. Welcome to The Surge. And what you probably immediately noticed, there's, I seem to be wearing a Google Cardboard on my face. This is a sci-fi Souls-like game. So, you might be asking, well, what, what is a Souls-like? What defines Souls-like? Is it a useful description? Because if it's not, then we shouldn't be using it, right? And if it becomes irrelevant, if it becomes diluted to the point where it's not useful, come on, then we don't want to be using it, obviously. Well, it's much, much better to use something accurate and descriptive. 
don't want to mislead people, of course. Well, by my definition of what a Souls-like is, it is a real-time RPG that has an emphasis on slow, methodical exploration that is predicated on the notion that you are going to die and will have to redo segments of the game to slowly advance. What it also generally implies is that it's going to have combat that has a lot of weight behind it, but more importantly, requires commitment to decisions, a very deliberate style of combat. This generally means attacks have a lot of weight, and once you've committed to an attack, the chances are you have got to see it through to the end. You may be able to cancel it, but that's often tied into a stamina system. You can see it right there. The green bar is the stamina in this case, and is being rapidly drained by things like dodging, blocking, and of course, these big swings. So if you commit to an attack, you're going to have to see it through, and you're going to have to deal with the consequences of that. Now, I would say that Souls-like games also rely very much on the gradual acquisition of resources that can be potentially lost through death, something that Demon's Souls initially established and has existed in all of the Souls-like games, Dark Souls all the way through to 3, it was in Bloodborne as well, and it was also in Lords of the Fallen, Deck 13's previous Souls-like title. And these resources will be spent to provide you with permanent upgrades. In this case, in the Surge, you have access to the Med Bay, which lets you upgrade what's called your core power, which is going to scale up the power of your implants, which are different pieces of equipment that have different effects, some of which are passive, some of which are what are called injectable, so potions, basically, that are reusable and you get a certain number of charges of, some which are triggered under certain circumstances, all that sort of thing. And core power, as it increases, is going to scale these implants up. Not only that, but core power is also used as a gating mechanic. There are terminals in the various levels which can be overcharged, and they have a certain power value. If you have that power value or higher, you can overcharge that terminal. It usually will open up a new area or a shortcut. And that in itself is another element of Souls-like games. Usually these large, sprawling environments that must be traversed and generally have shortcuts which allow you to eventually traverse them quicker, but only if you're able to discover those shortcuts and fight through the challenges to reach them. It's that very staggered and dogged sense of progress that I think defines the notion of Souls-like, especially when the majority of games in the Souls-like genre are actually the original Dark Souls series. Anyway, in terms of the Surge, that is the level of customization that you have. You don't have a large set of complex stats, but what you do have are these various equipable implants that can be hopped, swapped, and upgraded. In this case, this implant, which you get very early on, is basically an Estus flask for all intents and purposes. You get three potions out of it. They can only be refilled by visiting the Ops Center, the Ops Center being the equivalent of the bonfire, there are less of them than there are bonfires, certainly in Dark Souls. I've noticed that. In fact, there only seems to be one per major area. But the level design is based on uncovering various shortcuts to get back there quicker. And of course, if you don't bring your souls back there, in this case, tech scrap, well, you're not going to be able to spend money on upgrades. There are a couple of other things here. So, you know, this is a passive energy boost. This is quite nice. Every time you do a finishing move, you get some health restored. This is a straight-up health boost. This is a energy-controlled potion. So if I charge up enough energy, which is basically a combo meter in combat, I would be able to spend that energy on this to get myself a little heal. What's very interesting about the energy system that we'll show you once we get into a little bit more combat is that it adds an additional interesting layer of resource management that has a number of intriguing in-combat choices. Now, you also have a crafting system. Most of the equipment you get in this game is going to be crafted, and it's going to be crafted from schematics. These schematics are not all, but mostly acquired from enemies. And 
for the most part, the stuff that you get is going to be stuff that was equipped on the enemy that you just killed. And you will be able to acquire that through a very interesting method, which may remind you a little bit of Monster Hunter. You actually cut it off. You sever the limb. And as a direct result of that, you can acquire the parts that you want. And for the most part, it's armor, but you also get weapon drops. You can't craft weapons, but you can upgrade them. Every piece of equipment, including weapons, goes up to Mark IV, and that just scales the effectiveness up in general. And you need both tech scrap and a specific set of components to do that that all go through Marks I through four. Mark I's are very common, and obviously the various tiers of equipment are going to take different components, which may be more difficult to find. If I look at my specs right here, you can see all the stats. Certainly a bit bit more simplified compared to something like Dark Souls, which has a lot of different stats, but you can see some similarities. Things like stamina consumption and stability and energy gain, they're very important. You can see the kind of damage that I can do, which consists of various types, and of course those different weapons are going to do different things. The kind of defense that I've got, a set bonus if I'm wearing a full set of the particular type of gear. And weapon proficiencies, they're in the game as well. So the more you use a weapon, the more effective that weapon is going to be. Not a system I really like, personally. I, I think that, for the most part, this is a system that just limits your flexibility. Weapon proficiency very much punishes experimentation with new weapons, especially in a game that is this difficult. If I wanted to switch to, say, a staff or twin-rigged weapons, as far as I'm aware, there are five types of weapons in the game. None of them are ranged. You have the ability to use ranged powers, but they're basically magic. They're part of your drone, which is a little thing you can customize. It's melee combat pretty much the entire way through, but you can see the kind of various weapons I've got. Twin-rigged weapons, they are directly attached to the rig itself. As you can see, you have covered in cybernetics. You've got single-rigged weapons, same deal, but only one-handed. And then you've got things like heavy duty, which are giant hammers. Your basic one-handed weapons and staffs, and generally they just... It just alters the kind of damage they do, the sort of attack patterns you're going to be using, so specific combat styles, and also how they scale in various ways. I do like this hammer. It is very nice. Unfortunately, as I said, if I want to try the staff out, I have only proficiency one in staves, so the amount of damage I'm going to be doing with this is not very good because, yes, the weapons do scale. Although I have noticed that the lower level weapons that you get early on scale at a very low rate. You can see right here, proficiency scaling very low, which does mean that the punishment for switching weapon type is not as high. Unfortunately, once you start to get the more advanced weapons like this one, which came from a boss, the proficiency scaling is high. So you're going to eventually decide, I need to commit to this weapon because it just does flat out more damage. It's just more effective. It seems like you might want to maybe level up at least two kinds of weapon proficiency because certain weapons are good against certain kinds of enemies. I, I like the big hammer and I also like that single rigged giant knife thing. That is the staff and you've got your basic vertical and horizontal attacks here that can be charged and can be comboed together. And you might be thinking, so far so souls, right? Well, yes. There's no doubt that they're trying to create a game that is like Dark Souls but sci-fi. Different setting, However, there are a couple of things that are specifically different. I mentioned earlier how you get components to build weapons and armor. Well, let me demonstrate how I do that. You saw a little bit of it earlier, but I'm going to explain this system. So when you lock onto an enemy, you can then roll your mouse wheel. And yes, I'm using mouse and keyboard for this, and it works very, very well, surprisingly. You wouldn't expect that necessarily for a Souls-like game. But yeah, it seems like it was designed from the ground up for mouse and keyboard, and it works great. If you roll the mouse up and down, it's going to target a specific body part. And that doesn't mean you're going to automatically hit it. The game is hitbox based, just like the Souls games. So if I, let's say, if I do a kind of silly vertical swing that's off, I'm not going to hit that leg if it ends up like impacting the arm instead. So this is only part of the puzzle. You still have to aim. You still have to be careful. You can't just mindlessly slash away at a limb. But you may notice that these limbs have two different colors, blue and yellow. Yellow means it's armored. It's going to take a lot less damage. These are weak points, but this is the balance that you've got to strike because if you attack an armored body part and then you do a finisher, you have a chance of severing that body part, which means you can get schematics and you can get wreckaged parts of the equipment, which you can then build into new equipment or use to upgrade your existing. So we're going to take this guy out. 
So I'm going to run towards him. I'm going to go for like big overhead stab to start off. Just want to watch out because again, Soulsy combat means a lot of damage and they're not messing around in this game. I definitely overcommitted to that, but I was able to knock him over and kill them. I didn't quite build up enough energy for a finisher there. If I comboed more effectively, you notice the energy bar there, the blue one, which is now going down. Note those two little red indicators. Those are thresholds to use abilities. And that little saw icon means finisher. Finisher, it kills them, obviously. Takes about a second to warm up, so you are still vulnerable before you execute it. But then it tries to sever the limb. And whether or not you're able to sever that limb often comes down to how much damage you've done to it already. So if you've hammered on that limb a lot, you're more likely to sever it, but there are choices to be made. These enemies are difficult. If they hit you, they're going to take a lot of your HP. You may have noticed a couple of enemies hiding up there. I've yet to beat them. They too shot me. They're very effective. They have a stun cannon in their shoulder. They have staves, which can do 90 damage, which is most of my HP. They're incredibly tough. But there are various strategies to use here, and you're going to decide, do I want resources, which is going to make it a harder fight, because I'm going to be hitting armored areas, or do I want an easier kill? I just take this guy out of the legs, but I wouldn't be able to take parts of his body. And like, you know what? I might want that for crafting. But I'm running a risk there. Because honestly, what I've noticed with the Surge is that this game has less focus on boss fights than Dark Souls seems to have. And I base that on the fact that in four hours of play, I've only encountered a single boss, which in the Souls games would not be true at all. It seems like each area may just have one big boss, but what they've done is they've put a lot of emphasis on these trash mobs and made them very challenging in their own right. I've been working on this area for a while. There was a big difficulty spike once I beat the first area in the first boss, and I found myself here, and I've slowly sort of learned the patterns and how to best effectively deal with these guys, but I've also been investing a lot in upgrading my weapon and my equipment. If these guys actually get a hit off, oh, like that. You see, that was a basic thrust. Oh, God, and there's two of them now. <laughs> I think you have rapidly noticed just how difficult this game can be. Out of nowhere, straight away, boom. You were probably thinking, this looks easy. And then immediately just ambushed and destroyed. You can parry, you can dodge, but if they connect, oh, they're nasty. And these guys have a variety of different attacks they, almost every mob feels like a mini-boss. Like, there are a couple that you can't sever the limbs of that are just, like, drones and things. They feel like trash, but everything else doesn't really feel like trash. Like, it's... it's a, They're good. They're effective. And there's the limb sever there. And I was able to cut off his arm. If you see a piece of equipment you want, slice it off. You'll probably get it. Or at least part of it. As I said, most, most of this trash doesn't feel like trash. It just feels like they feel like mini-bosses on purpose. And whether or not that is good for you is going to come down to how much emphasis you put on boss fights. I think uh, most people are going to prefer the Souls method of doing it because a big boss fight is a huge achievement. It's a set piece. Trash mobs, not so much. But... It does mean the game remains consistently challenging. And if I look at the combat system of this game, which is one of the major problems, the major gripes that I actually had with Lords of the Fallen, this is a significant improvement on Lords of the Fallen. No doubt about that. The weapons feel heavy for a reason. They feel logically weighty. The combat styles are suitably different between the different weapon types. And the addition of the limb targeting system does fundamentally change the nature of the game. And I say that because you are dealing with the notion of making more decisions in combat, taking risks. And honestly, that's actually an aspect of Souls-like that I haven't brought up yet. The idea of taking risks risks for reward and also just how greedy you get as a player you'll hear that word a lot associated with dark souls when it's like ah that player got too greedy yeah he tried to go too far he delved too greedily and too deeply he awaked the balrog if you go whoa if you go too far if you go too fast and you're not able to properly handle the challenge that comes your way you can lose you lose progress you lose time you've got to manually make your way back there. I mean, look at the amount of damage I just, just took from one dude. 
Yeah, it is a big risk. Huge risk. And that risk reward is potent, but they've added an additional element of that in now. With the whole idea of limb severing and additional complexity with meter management. Of course, Dark Souls had meter management with stamina, but this isn't just a stamina bar that you have to manage. Uh-uh. Please tell me I just smashed through this. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm a, I'm a giant rig. Surely I can get through here. There we go. This isn't just stamina management. It's the energy bar management as well. So you're actively rewarded for comboing well, not spamming moves. You know, you're only gaining energy if you're actually connecting with them. If you're whiffing, that's not helping you at all. But then you're being asked to choose how you're going to spend it. I, if you take damage, you might want to spend it on heals, or you might want to spend it on consumable buffs, injectables. Or you might want to try and save that energy so that you can get a successful finisher off. Because you want more resources. If you do the finisher, you get more resources. And they've thrown in a nice little additional multiplier as well. The further you get into a level, the higher the multiplier goes up. So you're constantly rewarded, and you're tempted to risk it, risk it, risk it, get greedy. Mm. Very smart idea. I've been very impressed with the combat in general. The ability to slide in and do different attacks that way, the ability to do jump attacks, and the variety of vertical and horizontal quick attacks and charged swings, which are weapon specific, gives you a lot of choice as to how you want to fight. The only choice you really don't have is ranged. So, you know, you want to be a kind of magic user, you're fresh out of luck. Everybody gets a drone, but right now all my drone can really do is do a tiny little energy blast, which is really only useful for pulling mobs and shooting flying drones out of the sky. That really is about it. Otherwise, not particularly helpful. But outside of that, you know, if you want a fast combat style, you've got it. Twin rigged weapons and staves, and to some extent, one-handers are pretty quick. And of course, your heavy duty and your single rigged weapons are generally a bit slower, but that's going to vary on a weapon by weapon basis there are several varieties of them and you you get a good choice kind of right off of the bat in the first zone you get one of each weapon type pretty quickly i think one of them's hidden i think you've got to find the staff it's not immediately there and then you sort of make your decisions from there hey what kind of combat style do i like again shame about the proficiency though i don't really feel that's a good thing so combat wise it's done very well and i think it's Definitely one of the best Souls-like games up to this point when it comes to matching Dark Souls' combat and its prowess and the feel of that and what people like about that, uh, while also adding its own unique spin to it. God damn it! <laughs> uh, there's a reason I'm not doing WTFs of this game. I'm too bad at it to, to do that. That limb-severing idea and the additional resource management adds unique complexity to it. And of course, there's no doubt, adding a different theme into the game is something that's very attractive. You know, sci-fi Dark Souls doesn't exist right now, except in the form of The Surge. So, people might say, well, why don't I just play Dark Souls? Well, last time I checked, you're not a mech in Dark Souls. And yeah, that is a big deal for a lot of people. Retheming a game is a massive selling point. And maybe people just don't like Dark Souls theme. I know that might bring cries of heresy from the purists but no yeah of course some people don't like it, the theme of it but that does bring me on to a subject in regards to the notion of the souls like that these clones these different games by different studios are going to really really struggle to manage the reality of it is that while yes the combat and the exploration and the way that the game is paced are both defining aspects of Dark Souls and also important in any game that tries to ape it. There is something else which is much harder to replicate, and that is the feeling of Dark Souls, the despair, the mood of the world, the way that lore is delivered or not delivered. And that has tangible impacts on the game in the way that you play, very tangible impact on the way that you explore, the way that the levels are designed, huge, sprawling and varied levels. And most games are not going to be able to successfully ape that at all. Of course not. Of course they're not going to be able to do that. 
that's something that is quite unique to that developer and very, very hard to replicate. Does the Surge manage to do that? Well, it certainly has a lot of tension, and a lot of that comes from just how hard it is to beat these dudes. How difficult the game is. And yeah, that despair and that sense of caution can be inspired through difficulty. But generally speaking, there's also aspects like environmental design, aesthetic, and all that sort of thing, which are very important and taken into account. Uh, no, the Surge doesn't replicate that. There, there's certainly a, a degree of unease, without a doubt. You're dealing with machines that were once human. You have no idea what happened here. You know, there, there's an element of techno-horror going on. But it's very, very hard to create the same sort of feelings that you would get from a game like Dark Souls. And the same way it is you know, with a game like Bioshock, you know? Rapture was just so unique and awesome. Something that will stay with you forever not easily replicated i don't think the surge taps into that and most if not all souls like games may never but mechanically it does tap into a lot of what those games provided and it does it well and that's so important because lords of the fallen tried that and failed miserably pretty much it just didn't get it. The implementation of that stuff just wasn't good. But this time it is. Combat's got such weight behind it. And it's actually quite unique as well. I think the combat is surprisingly practical. Like, you may argue yet yeah, some of it's a little bit stylized, but I think most of it is practical combat. The kind of thing that you would experience if you were rigged up like this. A lot of these weapons are kind of improvised. They're industrial tools. And you fight as if they were as well. The weight behind each blow is because of the lack of agility that a big set of rigging like this would provide. It's not artificial. Or, well, actually, it kind of is. That's, that's the weird thing about it. It is thematically artificial, but not mechanically artificial. It doesn't feel like the delay is there for the sake of it being there. It feels like it's there because this shit weighs a ton. And I am a sort of prototype rigged exoskeleton. No, I'm not a ninja. It really feels like that, and that's great. So that adds thematically to the combat. Nope! Oh, yes, okay. I should never say nope. Just, just don't do it. Get out of the way. There we go. I'm kind of getting better, but... I find myself continuously sort of spamming moves and burning through my energy bars in ways that I'm not supposed to. Now, there are certainly some issues with this game that I found up to this point. Some major, some minor. While I said it was a very good PC version, and it is, runs well, great options, many, there's a couple of things missing. Uh, conspicuous by its absence is the ability to bind more than one injectable to a different key. You've got to cycle through them using C and then hit F. And considering the icons look quite similar, and you often have to do that in combat, it's not a particularly fun thing to do. Like, it's... You can make mistakes very easily. And I would have preferred to be able to bind those to separate keys. Why not? There's no real reason not to. So I'd like to have this, which is the energy triggered heal on maybe two. Put that on three, maybe four, you know? Any reason not to have a hot bar? No, not really. That's a pretty big deal. I'd like to see that change. The camera is not ideal. I, I Most of the time it's pretty good, but I found that in the first boss fight is where I most struggled with it. Just because of the size of the enemy. And actually trying to keep the enemy's arms in view so that I didn't get my head chopped off by an energy blade was quite tricky, especially while using lock-on. You don't have to use lock-on all the time. Lock-on is preferable in combat with these guys because, of course, you are dealing with this aspect of chopping off limbs. You can do it without, I think, you know, relying on the hitboxes, but, you know, it is extremely unreliable and difficult. So you got to be using lock-on most of the time, I think if you want to gather resources optimally. Is there still another dude around there? I'm pretty sure there is. Let's see if I can pull him with my drone here. I'll just bring him up the stairs. Better place to fight him. Come on. Mush, mush. Ah! <laughs> I got more than I bargained for. There we go. Let's get him out of the way. There we go. Take off his right arm and finish her. Lovely. Occasionally, you'll also notice the animations bug out. The kind of decouple. Most of the time, the animations are very, very good. But... Every now and again, something like that will happen. I was surprised by the variety of finisher animations. 
All sorts of different ones. Because, of course, there's different body parts of Sever. They all have their own finishes. Different weapons have their own finishes. Looks great. Flows very, very smoothly. Combat animation is generally good. But, like I said, you know, animation bugs and some camera problems. Now, if I had a minor complaint that actually might be my biggest, it actually is the fact that in the op center, there is a piece of repetitive country music that runs the whole game that you can't turn off. It's the worst. I despise it. Absolutely dreadful. Dreadful stuff. Please, please, before launch, let me turn that off. The version that we played as press also had some bugs, but... A lot of those were fixed in a build that came out yesterday, so you most likely will not experience that. There we go, we're able to customize our drone a little bit. Now apparently does a concussive impact attack. That'll be fun to try out. This is as far as I've ever gotten, by the way. And I'm sitting on a ton of scrap and I really want to go back to ops. I don't think there's any way to teleport, but like I said, you can unlock shortcuts. The problem is a lot of those shortcuts follow, I suppose, a logical set of progression through the level, and there's multiple pathways. So sometimes you can go sort of way too far down. Like, this is a great example of that. Like, Ops is this way, yes. Thankfully, they do signpost it. They don't try and hide things too much in this game, which I do appreciate. And since the environments are often industrial areas and factories, of course, of course, you're not going to hide those areas. You're going to signpost them logically. There is no map, but most of the time, the levels are logically designed. But like souls, you can go in a lot of different directions, and some of them are the wrong directions. You see, I can't go any further there. You know, I've hit a brick wall that I can't pass, and I'm going to have to head back. So there is a lack of elegance in some of the design that you will hit those dead ends rather than elegantly looping back around, but quite a lot of it's pretty well done. And if you can find those shortcuts, that's great. And I think this is an example of a shortcut as well. I can just hop over here now. And it looks like there's a way to an op center here as well. In fact, this actually might be another op center. I wasn't aware there was a second one. Looks like there might be, though, so we can head in that direction. Oh, God! <laughs> Don't do that. Why? All right, yeah. Set my drone to ram him. Get him. Nice. Lovely. I could have done the sever there, but it's nice to try that out. Thank you. And let me guess. I can't get in. Can I smash through? I can. Good. It's not the sort of game that I will probably have a lot of patience with because, like I said, I'm just I'm just too bad at it. And I don't really enjoy replaying the same segment of a game over and over again. And there is an element of grinding, too. In the first level, I went into the boss, got murdered, and decided, you know what? We're going to grind a bit. We're going to get some more souls. Tech scrap. <laughs> get our upgrades and all that kind of thing. And then once I have all the upgrades I want, and once I've upgraded the power core to where I want it to be, well, at that point, that is when I will fight them. Please tell me there is actually an ops through here and I'm not just advanced in the wrong direction. I really want to cash in right now. That would be nice. But those that have enjoyed games like Dark Souls and Soulsborne, uh, to Bloodborne, god damn it. <laughs> yeah, I think they, they will find elements of those games that they enjoyed here, no doubt. Excellent, this actually did take me back. So you can see how this whole thing looped around. This is a completely different area. That's where I came from. So, now I can get back here and do some upgrades and all that good stuff. Storyline-wise, though, exploration-wise, exploring this strange, unique world and discovering little factoids about it, they're just a bit more on the nose. Like, you saw there was a conversation system. Happens every now and again. You meet, you meet these living people, certainly. And there are audio logs around the place as well. But there's not a lot of environmental storytelling. And the levels in general, because they're very industrial, especially in the first five hours, are going to look quite samey. So some people might have issue with that. But honestly, for the most part, I'm actually really impressed with The Surge. And I'm always joyous when I see a developer take another crack at something that they previously failed at and really nail it that time around. You've got a more unique setting instead of your generic fantasy nonsense. You've got a cool combat system with new aspects that are not in the Souls games that add depth and complexity, but they've nailed the combat system this time around and made it feel really, really good. And of course, fighting with these unique, strange-looking weapons, even if the character looks a bit weird, to say the least, and goofy, is a cool experience. Although, I will say that the game definitely lacks in terms of visual customization. 
You can't customize your character in any way. You can't change the color of armor or anything like that. I would like to see upgraded armor maybe have more bits on it, maybe change colors. Can't do any of that. So any of you that enjoyed fashion cells, well, you're not going to be seeing anything like that here. I'm just looking for an upgrade here. There we go. I can upgrade that big hammer. One of my favorite weapons. Finally got the parts to upgrade it to level two. I'm seeing if I have any upgrade capacity. No, unfortunately not. But hey, get to upgrade a weapon. Not bad. I could also upgrade that single rigged weapon there as well that I've been using. You might think, well, you should probably just use the boss weapon. Well, they do different damage types. So upgrading different weapons is good because sometimes something like that just won't be effective. An armored enemy might not respond well to cutting weapons. Simple as that. Cool. I can now equip my nice big stompy hammer. As a genre, where's this going? And is it a genre? Ah, <sighs> It's a tricky one. It really comes down to your own personal definition. What does genre mean to you? To film goers, a genre is often used in place of theme. Horror is a genre. Sci-fi is a genre. But really, that's not true, is it? If you think about it. Because the genre describes the kind of mechanical structure, the way that something is built, the style in which something's built, as opposed to the way that it's themed. And I say that because if we look at gaming in particular, even in film this applies... You can have a sci-fi film and you say, right, well, that's a genre. Yeah, but this is a sci-fi horror or this is a sci-fi thriller or this is a sci-fi action. This is a sci-fi drama, a sci-fi comedy. Now, that's, that's the genre right there. And you've got a great description there because you've combined the theme with the style of film that you're expecting to see. I love sci-fi, but I don't like horror. So if you tell me a movie sci-fi and I go and watch it, it ends up being horror, I'm probably not going to enjoy it. And I'm going to come back to you and say, oh, no, I didn't enjoy that. But if you told me it was a sci-fi horror, I would have known what to avoid. With games in particular, because games are so focused on game mechanics, things that are objective, they're technical, they're scientific, they're systems, they can be quantified. It's much easier to quantify a genre through those bundles of mechanics. So I say racing game, you know what that is. I could say sci-fi racing game, and the sci-fi wasn't the genre component there. It was just an affix. It was applied and gave me a better idea of what to expect. And frankly, the, the more of that that you put on there, the better. If you call a game a roguelite, it's not helpful. It describes a set of design philosophies, but I don't think that's a genre. If you look at the way that roguelites tend to work out, if you look at the breadth of roguelikes, roguelites, not roguelikes. Roguelike is a genre. <laughs> roguelite is not you will clearly see there are roguelite platformers, roguelike, roguelite, I keep doing this, I hate it, <laughs> roguelite turn-based strategy games, roguelite top-down twin sticks, roguelite first-person shooters. These are quite clearly different genres, but they use a set of common design philosophies. In the case of roguelite, the three things that I would use to define it are randomly generated levels, permadeath, and meta progression. The ability to either cash in some sort of progress to power up or change your experience the next run, or unlock something new that will also appear and affect the next run. We're going to head back in this direction here, I think. That's how I would define roguelite, but it's not a genre. When I look at Souls-like, you're in a pretty similar situation. But I think simply because of where Souls Like came from and the lack of games currently in it, it is a useful genre descriptor for the time being. Because there simply aren't many games in it, to the point where if I say Souls Like, you're going to think real time, third person action RPG. It's what a Souls Like is. Pretty much all of them are, with a couple of exceptions. Sultan Sanctuary is a 2D Souls-like. But again, that just described it quite well. Same kind of combat, same kind of die and go back and lose your progress, slowly progress through the world, big non-linear exploration, very difficult boss fights, etc. All of that is in there, but it's 2D. So if you describe it as 2D, you're fine. 
and eventually you might see something insane like, oh, it's a Souls-like racer. <laughs> I'd love to see that. That would be quite amusing. Obviously, this is not the right way to go, but hey. For the most part, yeah, you know what Souls-like means. But eventually, it will probably become more like roguelite. Because there'll be different genres that use these design philosophies of die and reset your progress, respawning trash, slow deliberate combat, the way resource collection and loss is done and all that kind of thing. But right now, that's not really true. It's very similar to the way that Doom Clone evolved into first person shooter. If I use the word Doom Clone now, it's actually a more accurate genre descriptor than first person shooter is. You might think, you're insane. Like, no, actually, it's all come back around now. Because first-person shooter is now so wide, there are so many games in it that do things differently, the only thing that they have in common is that they're from a first-person and they involve shooting. Outside of that, they can do a whole bunch of different things. You know, the example being looter shooters and FPS RPGs. Immersive sim. Things like Prey and the original Deus Ex are in that particular genre now. They're technically first-person shooters, but they use the term immersive sim to kind of describe it. But if I say Doom clone now, it's a very specific expectation. You expect old-school, action-oriented, maze-like, first-person shooter. That's what you expect. No bloody stats progression or anything along those lines. No, no, no. This is the way we went. No, no. You have very specific expectations now that I say Doom clone. And that will that's currently the case with Souls-like. And it probably won't stay that way. Eventually, there'll be enough games that take that idea that it will become like roguelite and it will become a bundle of mechanics and design philosophy applied to different genres. Whereas right now, it is currently a genre that gives very specific expectations. The final point that I would like to make is when people say, oh, these damn clones do something original. They are doing original things. They're iterating and innovating within an existing framework. And that is the way that genres truly flourish to greatness. If that did not happen with Doom, if Doom clones did not exist and eventually become first-person shooter, we would have been denied so many great experiences later on. If RPGs did not develop in the way that they did, would have been denied so many later on. It used to be a case that people would describe the sort of top-down ARPG as Diablo clones? Well, think about what we would not have if people said you can't make Diablo clones. It would suck. Absolutely suck. I love it when games take ideas from other games and try and iterate or take them in a different direction because not only does it expand the genre, but we're talking about an element of consumer choice. Think about this. When I describe it as a Souls-like game. If you're the sort of person that does not enjoy Dark Souls, but thinks, hey, you know what? I could, given certain changes. You should be applauding the fact that games like this exist. Because maybe one of these games actually does that. Maybe they do make the changes that you want. In this case, you know, they've made certain things a little bit simpler, more straightforward. And I kind of like that. Maybe some people don't like big boss fights. Maybe they find them hugely intimidating. They'd rather just fight a lot of regular enemies. Well, this game does that too. Maybe they just don't like the theme. Well, you know, this is the most big obvious change. This is sci-fi now. That's great. I found an audio log. I was hoping to find my way through here, but apparently not so much right now. No, we need more games that do that and do it well. If it's a bad clone or if it just doesn't change enough to be sort of its own entity... I think there's a difference between a clone and a ripoff. A game clearly inspired by something and a game just trying to flagrantly steal. I don't think this game tries to flagrantly steal, no. It takes an approach, changes the theme, puts its own ideas in, and does it well. That should be applauded. That is, in my honest opinion, a very good thing for the industry. And as it stands, The Surge is a very competent product from what I can tell very impressed I was expecting something a lot less competent at what it does than what I ended up finding so bravo 
to deck 13 for being able to do that. Because it ain't an easy genre to make a good game in. And plenty have failed before, and more will fail, no doubt, in the future. And I'm doing no bloody damage to this thing whatsoever. I should try and cut off its real legs, shouldn't I? Yeah, there's his weak spot. The Surge will be released on May the 16th for $50 or your regional equivalent. Available on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC. This has been my thoughts on The Surge that I am incredibly terrible at and I am dying to a maintenance bot. <laughs> oh dear. Thank you for watching, folks. I'm sure you'll be much better at this game than I am. I'll see you next time.